Okay, this is May 2018, time zone one, higher level chemistry. So, paper one, we've got a little periodic table, cut off the side, and then we've got question one. So, what is the molecular form of a hydrocarbon containing 84.6% carbon by mass with a molar mass of 142.3? Now, of course, we're going to have a calculator in this exam. Uh, let's take the information a bit at a time. First of all, let's work out the molar mass of these substances, see which ones match. So the first one, it's C20, so that's 20 times 12 plus 44. Well, 10 12s are 120, so that's double that. That's 240 plus 44, so that's 284. So that's far too heavy. It can't be that one. It's uh, double the mass, basically. Uh, 11 times 12 plus 10. So that's uh, 10, 12, 120, 132, 142, so it could be that one, 142. What about this one, 10, 12s plus 22. Again, that comes to 142, could be that one, and then five times 12, well, that doesn't look like enough, plus 11, that's 60, plus 11, 71, so can't be that one. So we've narrowed it down to these two. So even if we had a guess now, we'd have a 50-50 chance rather than a 25% chance. However, let's see if we can make use of this bit. So that's an odd number, and of course we don't have uh, a calculator with us. So what could we do with this? Well, how would we work out the percentage by mass of carbon in this substance? Well, the carbons contribute here. 11 times 12, we said, was 132. So they contribute 132 out of the 142 times 100, whereas in this one down here, 10 times 12, they contribute 120 out of the 142, and then times 100. Now, that's an awkward number to deal with, but... What if we then sort of thought, okay, well, what would 80% and 90% be? And the simplest way to get to that, well, what is 10%? Well, 10% of this mass would be approximately 14. So 80% then would just be approximately 8 times that. So that would be uh, 80 plus uh, 40 is 32, that would be 112. So that would be approximately 112. Whereas what would 90% be? Because then we go on either side of this. Well, 90%, that would be 90. That would be an extra 12 on, extra 14 on top, basically, wouldn't it? So that's 112. That would be 126. So it can't be this one because 132 is greater than 126. So this is greater than 90% by mass. Whereas 120 fits quite nicely between those. In fact, it's roughly midway, which is what we'd expect for 85%. So that is our correct answer. So we're just simplifying the mass a bit, really, uh, to make it achievable. Number two, which graph shows the relationship between the volume and pressure of a fixed mass of an ideal gas? Well, PV equals nRT, so P equals nRT over V. So V is inversely proportional to B. When it's inversely proportional, we need a nice curve showing that as uh, volume increases, pressure decreases, or vice versa, as pressure increases, then volume decreases. So we want to go with this one here, okay? Because that one, you don't get a straight line. Inversely proportional, you always get a curve. Uh, this one, if it had been one over pressure or one over volume, then that would be the correct graph. Because a good way to show that something's inversely proportional is to plot the reciprocal of one of the values, and then you get a directly proportional uh, relationship as shown here. Question three, what is the percentage yield when seven grams of ethene produces six grams of ethanol? Okay, so, well, number of moles of ethene then, that's going to be seven over 28. And the number of moles of ethanol that have been made would be six over 46 moles. Now, it's a one-to-one -one ratio, so that's the maximum number of moles that we could have made. So that's the theoretical amount of moles that could be made, and that's the moles we actually got. So the percentage yield would be the number of moles we got, 6 over 46, divided by the number of moles that we could have got, 7 over 28 times 100. Of course, when you've got one fraction divided by another fraction, that is equivalent to 6 over 46 times this fraction the other way around. So that would be times 28 over 7 and then times 100. So which of those does that match up well with? That matches up well with B. Number four, which are correct statements about the emission spectrum of hydrogen in the visible region? Well, red line has a lower energy than the blue line. Well, if we remember Roy Gabiv, and then uh, that's your visible region, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And then, of course, we've got infrared, which is lower energy here, and ultraviolet, which is higher energy. So this is your high energy end. Well, the red line has a lower energy than the blue line. Well, yes, red is lower in energy than blue. So that's correct. 
If the lines converge at longer wavelength, well, remember your emission spectrum kind of looks like this, where you've got them well spaced out, but as they then start to converge at high energy. So they actually converge at high energy, and that would be a low or short wavelength. Because remember, wavelength does the opposite to energy and frequency. Energy, high energy is a high frequency, but a short wavelength. So if this one's incorrect, they would converge at shorter wavelengths because they converge at higher energy. And the frequency of the blue line is greater than the frequency of the red line. Well, if this was like the red, green, blue, and then kind of violet across here, well, blue is a higher energy than red, which means it's a higher frequency. So this one is correct again as well. Remember, the reason they converge at this high energy is when you get the Bohr model of the atom, the electron uh, shells get closer together the further you go from the nucleus. So this is what causes the visible light as they fall down to n equals 2. And of course, it's just that little bit more energy released each time, and that's why they then converge at higher energy. So we're looking for 1 and 3 only. Which transition on the diagram corresponds to the ionization of hydrogen in the ground state? Well, the ionization energy would be where it reaches n equals infinity, and it would have started from the ground state. So we're looking at this one here. Okay? So in the ground state, of course, the electron is in the first energy level for hydrogen, and then when it reaches n equals infinity, that's when it's then left the atom. This would be the reverse of that ionization energy. This would be exothermic, that would be endothermic. And these, of course, are where the electron's already been promoted to n equals 2, which it would be in, in an excited state. Number six, which describes the oxide of sodium oxide? Uh, well, it's metal, non-metal, so we're looking for ionic. Uh, it won't conduct when it's a solid, only when it's a liquid, because the ions need to be free to move and carry a charge. And, of course, we'll get a high pH, because if you add that to water, it reacts to give you sodium hydroxide, which is a strong alkali. So D is the right answer. Number seven, which statement is correct? Atomic radius decreases down group 17. Well, it doesn't matter what group it is. It's always the same. So atomic radius increases going down the group because you start a new energy level. So it's not that one. First ionization energy decreases down the group. Well, again, doesn't matter what group it is. First ionization energy always does the same, which is it decreases. It's easier to remove an electron as you go down the group because it'll be in a shell, which is further from the nucleus and less strongly attracted. So that's looking good. Atomic radius increases across period free from sodium to chlorine. Uh, well, no, it actually decreases because you're adding electrons to the same shell, but you're increasing the nuclear charge, so they get pulled in more tightly. And then first ionization energy decreases across period free. Well, no, again, first ionization energy always does the opposite to what the atomic radius is doing. So if the atomic radius is decreasing, that's going to make it harder to remove an electron because of the bigger nuclear charge. Uh, so first ionization energy actually increases across a period. So it's not that one, so we're looking for... B. Number eight, which complex has the greatest d orbital split in? Well, we've got a choice of these six complex, uh, four complex ions here. They're all uh, octahedral complexes. This one's got ammonia in, which ammonia is higher in the spectrochemical series, so you would expect it to give a higher split in. Of course, the bigger the charge on the metal ion, the greater the split in because it pulls the electrons in more tightly. So we're going to rule out that one because it's got a smaller uh, charge on the metal ion. So then it's the colour of the complex. Now, of course, we don't have the colour wheel with us. But remember, what we see is the colour which is not absorbed. So if this does not absorb blue or violet light, those are quite high energy lights. Because, of course, remember Roy Gaviv. Uh, if it's not absorbing blue or violet light, then it's not absorbing a particularly high energy, so the splitting must be relatively small. Whereas if it's transmitting orange, it's appearing orange because it's absorbing a higher energy light across here, and we're then seeing one of these colours being absorbed and the other colour transmitted. So it's actually going to be this one because it's transmitting a low energy light, which means it's, so like, uh, it's probably absorbing a higher energy. Certainly not these two, because these are absorbing... A higher energy form of light because they must have um, well they're not absorbing a high energy light they're actually allowing blue and violet fluid and not absorbing it so I would go with B. Okay. Which form of carbon is the poorest electrical conductor? Uh, graphite, graphene, diamond, carbon nanotube. Well it's going to be diamond because it's got no delocalized electrons because it's four bonds per carbon nice and easy whereas these guys will go three bonds per carbon which leaves them with one delocalized electron per carbon. 
And then what is the molecular geometry and bond angle in the molecular ion NO3 minus? That's the nitrate ion. So of course your Lewis structure would be like that, a coordinate bond member in the nitrate ion. Uh, in reality, of course, it's a resonance hybrid where there is no proper double bond. All of them have some kind of double bond character. Uh, so all bonds would be the same length and the same strength. And of course, there's free electron domains around the nitrogen, the double bond, single, single. So free electron domains would be trigonal planar because uh, there's no lone pairs. And then perfect bond angle of 120 degrees, uh, which again is explained with the resonance hybrid because there is no proper double bond. Then you've got 120 degrees uh, bond angle around the mole. Like so. so that would be B.